Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We are absolutely delighted to have you with us today. It's really a, a huge privilege to have just a small amount of time. It was a huge privilege to, to be with each other yesterday evening and today from now until 2.30 to have to be in each other's presence and to be able to share uh, what's very dear to us and what's very near to everyone's heart and, and lives and work. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, thanks for um, your attention in advance. Uh, I'm going to be the, the uh, moderator and the person who's going to keep everybody uh, running on a schedule. It's not easy, but I'm going to take this work very seriously because, so in order that we can really uh, take the, the most advantage, make the most advantage of our time together. So um, we have two, we will have two panels this morning, followed by a relatively quick lunch, which will be in the courtyard. We have, I think, an hour for lunch, not more. We'd like to start uh, the panels on time. And we would like to uh, have lunch and come back at 2.30. We have also time to network afterwards. For those of you who might want to see have not had the time, had travel difficulties, and didn't have the time to see the exhibition from 2.30 on, please feel free to do that if you'd like. But until then, do stay with us. So without much uh, further ado, I would like to introduce you to our uh, executive director, Fabienne Lupo, the person who is uh, held this uh, Homo Faber exhibition in her hands, and uh, along with uh, a, a lot of other of us, but who really carried us here today. So uh, I turn over to Fabienne to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, welcome to all of you. I'm particularly proud today to, uh, to be with, uh, with you all because um, as Barbara just mentioned, it has been an immense and very hard work uh, made all together to create uh, uh, these exhibitions. We, we are working on it since two, two years and a half now, uh, since the, the, the very beginning and the inception of the Michelangelo Foundation. Um, the, the Michelangelo Foundation has been created in uh, October 2016 uh, by uh, uh, Mr. Johan Rupert and Mr. Franco Coloni with the ambition to promote, preserve, and perpetuate the craftsmanship and creativity, and the manual know-how. So, especially in the, in the age of machines and uh, artificial intelligence. And this is really what uh, we, we wanted to achieve with this first exhibition of Homo Faber. Uh, we have conceived Homo Faber like a biennale of craftsmanship and creativity, here in Venice, in this incredible premises of the Fondazione Eccini. Uh, and we wanted uh, really to, sho to show, to showcase the know-how, the expertise of these incredible craftsmen and women uh, with uh, their golden fingers uh, in order that uh, they can, um, in order to make them visible, uh, recognize, and to help them to find clients also for, for the objects that they create in order that they can uh, live by means of their expertise and uh, especially pass on also to the young generation their know-how and expertise in order that to avoid that all this um, um, know-how is disappearing forever. Today, uh, it's a very special day because uh, all the team uh, created uh, this beautiful parterre of personalities, of association, foundation, museums, schools, private and public. And all together, you are part of the Michelangelo Network, a European network. So this is the first get together of uh, our network. And uh, we hope that today we will, uh, we will uh, put a special uh, stone uh, for the foundation of our foundation 
and to the network, uh, European network, uh, because as uh, Jacques said yesterday, you are the, um, the, the Europe of Métier d'Art. So we are the Europe of Métier d'Art, and we need you, we need you to go further. We thank you already for the, for the help and support you gave us to build this first edition of Homo Faber, but we need you to go further, to, to go forward, uh, because uh, we are at the very beginning and uh, we want all together build a, a more human future with you. But before starting the conference, uh, I just want to, to thank you, uh, all the team of the Michelangelo Foundation, working uh, especially on the constitution of, of, of this network, uh, spotting you, meeting you, uh, uh, convincing you to come to join us in this uh, beautiful uh, human adventure, especially Barbara, especially Jacques, and especially also Céline, who, who made an immense work uh, building uh, all this network and, and I think that it's culminating today with uh, all of you all together face to face to craft, as I said before, a more human future. Thank you, I wish you a wonderful day and uh, see you maybe at the end of the, of the conferences to, to, to give you some homework. Thank you. Thank you, Fabienne. Uh, now to begin the first panel on the evaluation of craftsmanship. As you probably all are aware, evaluating craftsmanship is something that is of great interest to the Michelangelo Foundation. We feel that it elevates the status, societal status of artisans and that it has the potential to attract the interest of younger generations by doing this. But we also feel it's important that we, we understand that every Every country and every tradition has their, their own point of view, and we're very interested to discuss the various points of view and, um, bring, and bring them to light for you. So um, I would like to call to the stage the participants of this uh, panel. Reinhold Franz, who is an art historian and curator at the MAC, the Museum of Applied Arts in Vienna. He will moderate for us. Louise Allen, who is president of the World Crafts Council of Europe and head of innovation and, and development at the Design Craft Council of Ireland. Please. Yeva Squarone, head of monumental art de department at the Vil Vilnius Academy of Arts in Lithuania. Gerard Descamps, who is Maître d'Art, a heraldic engraver, one of France's finest heraldic engravers, and the former president of the Institut National des Métiers d'Art in Paris. And walking through the back door as we speak, Mr. Alberto Cavalli, who is director of the Fondazione Coloni <laughs> and one of the Michelangelo Foundation's executive directors. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues and friends, um, first I would like to uh, say many thanks to Michelangelo Foundation for inviting me to uh, moderate uh, this uh, morning session, uh, which I think uh, really focuses on a um, problem that uh, uh, we and uh, the crafts uh, people of the 21st century all face. Uh, um, it's about uh, the evaluation of uh, what we call uh, crafts nowadays. And uh, uh, when uh, preparing this session, um, I um, came back to something that uh, uh, had been done um, during uh, the year 2016 in Austria, uh, when I was uh, staging this handicraft exhibition in uh, uh, Vienna. The Austrian Ministry um, for um, Economy and uh, the Austrian Chancellery um, worked, uh, teamed up with uh, UNESCO and they published uh, this book, which is unfortunately only in uh, uh, German, uh, 
but uh, it tackles, uh, I think, uh, many um, problems that we um, hopefully will discuss uh, in this morning session. Uh, it's about traditional uh, handicraft as uh, uh, immaterial cultural heritage uh, and as an uh, important uh, economic factor in, uh, in Austria. And the book and the study that lies behind it, uh, we uh, presented this book uh, in our museum when we were staging the handicraft exhibition, um, goes very much into uh, the problems that uh, we hopefully will uh, discuss this morning. Uh, because uh, speaking about uh, um, the problems of uh, evaluating craft, uh, I think there is there are basically um, two things that uh, we should bear in mind. On the one hand, uh, we are talking about the social status uh, of uh, uh, craft. What uh, does craft uh, mean to society nowadays? Uh, what's the um, question about the appreciation of uh, crafts uh, in society? And of course, on the other hand, uh, we are speaking about the economic status of uh, crafts. Uh, where's the recognition of the uh, craftsmen in this field, uh, where's the recognition for the efforts taken for the training and the study and training of the craftsmen in comparison to what we are um, uh, always uh, seeing as uh, crucial in the study and training for students. So this is, uh, I think this is a, a wide field we should uh, start uh, to talk about. Uh, um, Barbara has made a um, short uh, uh, introduction uh, to uh, my uh, panel here, and I would uh, like to um, start uh, with uh, giving a first uh, question uh, to Luis uh, about uh, this uh, problem. How do you face as uh, uh, head of uh, uh, World Craft uh, this uh, problem of uh, evaluating craft? Is this uh, um, are you? Uh, uh, aware of this and, and how is this uh, taken into consideration in your work? Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think it's a very important question. Uh, it struck me uh, just with the panel and with Regiland and talking to some of uh, the people here that actually probably museums were the first um, organizations really to have uh, a role in, in evaluating craftsmanship um, just through their collections obviously. And uh, the work then that's been done um, by many organizations, I suppose, including the World Crafts Council Europe, in trying to uh, set a standard and also, I suppose, a common definition for what, what craft is and what it represents. Um, and across Europe, that can be indeed very challenging because, for example, um, in France, uh, I think Atelier d'Art France uh, name over 281 uh, different disciplines that are recognized as crafts. In Ireland, for example, we have about 30 on our list. So there's huge disparity in, ter in terms of uh, what's considered to be a craft. Um, and I know, I, I think uh, I want to commend Alberto Gavalli for the work that he did in, his, in, in, in the uh, Master's Touch, um, because that really is trying to ground it. And we, we absolutely uh, need a common mechanism and a common definition for how we can evaluate craftsmanship. Um, but obviously, it's a complex territory because there are many different levels. Um, and I think what one of the wonderful things about Homo Faber is looking at those beautiful videos in Singular Talents, um, because I suppose the uh, origin of this group is obviously from a lu luxury perspective. Um, but just talking with you, Reginald, I was saying, well, well my luxury um, is probably very different from somebody else's luxury. And I suppose the per there are parameters in, in, which, uh, in which I operate. Um, and I think that in evaluating craft and in valuing it, uh, there's a huge amount of education that needs to be undertaken, not only from the perspective of preservation of skills and heritage, but obviously also in terms of educating young generations as to what that value is and maybe why they should be looking at investing, why they should be collecting. And really, I suppose the, um, the, the inherent authenticity and integrity of that kind of an investment and, and really a change of the mindset that we have today, which has become very much a throwaway disposable culture. And we all know that that needs to change. So I think that uh, the timing of, of this particular panel and conference um, is hugely important. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think um, the, uh, what, what's important, uh, 
will be in the future is to bring together these um, efforts that you that you see in uh, all over Europe because uh, this what this is what, what struck us when we were doing this handicraft exhibition in 2015 16 to see um, this very different approaches I mean there's craft council in Great Britain there is uh, the Compagnon du Duvoir in France there is the Haus der Farbe in Switzerland and um, what I think um, this uh, it, it should be important to to have a joint effort to uh, come to at least basic uh, uh, evaluative uh, uh, measures in in uh, all over Europe at least in in, in in this way. Eva, I wanted to ask you, because you're um, somebody who is also very much uh, um, into the uh, education of uh, craft at the uh, Vilnius uh, Academy of Arts, um, how do you um, experience the uh, contemporary uh, education for the craftsmen in, in your field and, and in your country and in Lithuania especially? Mm -hmm. So, hello everybody. Um, to answer the question, I would say that it's also an everyday challenge to, to keep those uh, hands-on study programs or practice-based, as we call, I mean, it was the old expression, uh, applied art, um, one or another study program, just um, to balance between uh, keeping the craftsmanship and um, being also the nowadays contemporary artist uh, or designer together. So it's like um, to help students, uh, to encourage them to get the skills and at the same time to, to, to read books, you know, to, to know uh, art theory to, and, uh, and to combine skills and idea and the contextualization of the, of, uh, of the ideas together with, with crafts. And this is the way I see how to, one of many ways, of course, but one uh, would be just to keep the craftsmanship in higher education of fine arts and design in Europe. It's because, you know, it's really nowadays to, to create contemporary art, you don't need to be uh, good in crafts. And, uh, and uh, even on the contrary, you know, there is so much of theory that uh, why do you need this uh, work or sweatening? What for? It's always the students are questioning. What for? You are, you are working on stained glass. What for? Are you keep on with the material in ceramics? Why is this material is for you is important? And the students need to give the answer every day to themselves, to their teachers, to uh, to, to those who perceive their uh, art. And uh, therefore, I'm very grateful to Michelangelo Foundation for uh, Young Ambassadors Program, because uh, there they can find the many answers, the, uh, their questions by themselves or by others every day. Mm. Thank you. There's a, I think there is a very um, uh, nice uh, video of one of your uh, pupils in the, in the exhibition, which shows very well this uh, approach. It was, uh, very, very impressive. Um, uh, I would like to um, um, go a little bit further in this, Monsieur uh, uh, Descon. Uh, do you um, see uh, in your experience as a uh, master craftsman in the third uh, generation and uh, also as a uh, teaching person who has uh, been successful in uh, bringing his uh, uh, workshop uh, into another generation with your we are pupil taking over. Um, to what extent do you see the uh, influence of modern techniques uh, in uh, what is uh, uh, limited d'art in, in France today? Yes. Um, so uh, I am very proud and honored to, to take part uh, in this conference. Uh, but I, I apologize uh, for my uh, English, uh, <laughs> uh, which is not always correct. So, um, um, in 30 years ago, um, we, um, the need was to change the, the state of mind and uh, 
made people at, uh, uh, look at art and crafts. Um, in the 70s, uh, we started from uh, a vertical look uh, at the profession, and uh, each uh, sector, each arts and crafts sector was uh, closed, um, vertical and closed. But it was very difficult. Uh, and uh, the situation um, happened for um, the 2000s. Uh, whereas today it's more, it's more transversal. Um, if you like, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at uh, young people now, um, the young people have um, uh, a different uh, backgrounds with uh, fundamental values uh, like uh, sharing, uh, putting in common uh, technical. And uh, to give an, an example, uh, someone uh, uh, with an economic uh, education uh, can help uh, someone uh, more technical with a more technical background and when they work together. Um, over the years, uh, I, I could notice the evolution of uh, young students and their uh, interest uh, for the nature um, and, uh, and the future of um, our living conditions. Uh, it in, increased them, their mutual un understanding. So it, it's necessary to, to trust them and uh, they show us the way. Yeah. And uh, it's, our, it's our duty, um, um, it's our duty and mission uh, to accompany them. Um, so, <laughs> um, but today it's, it's necessary to choose uh, what uh, we must keep and protect for the future of our culture. Um, for instance, uh, Japanese, after the Second uh, World War, um, decided uh, to choose what was important um, to keep so as maintain uh, maintain the their culture, and so they created the living national treasures. That's very important thing. Uh, even if today they think um, uh, about the, the evolution of the shape and uh, uh, to, to, to get close to European creators. It's a new position. Um, so. Thank you very much. Um, Alberto, um, I would uh, uh, like to ask you, uh, as uh, somebody who is uh, teaching Bellezza Italiana at the Politecnico di Milano, and uh, as the one who has uh, opened this uh, beautiful uh, view on uh, contemporary crafts with Homo Fava here, um, speaking about uh, uh, evaluating crafts. Um, what was your experience? Because you um, uh, did this uh, perfect book, uh, The Master's Touch, where you really went very deeply into uh, criteria that uh, should be useful uh, in evaluating craft. Uh, and this experience combined to the experiences that you had with this exhibition. Um, could you give us a little bit uh, of an insight of uh, what came, uh, what, what, what was the outcome for you, uh, if, if one can say it uh, now as we are still in the middle of the exhibition? Right, thank you. Um, 
Actually, the idea of condensing in a book these 11 criteria to try to evaluate uh, excellence in craftsmanship came from a moment, and, and I think that my friends from Florence were there too. Uh, one day, many years ago, we were in Rome, and there were so many like people, the minister of something, the sous secretaire of something else, and they were all signing something about fine craftsmanship. And they all delivered a speech about fine craftsmanship. And they were talking about something they had no idea about. And we were there with Pilar, with Benedetta, uh, I think uh, like that they were uh, with Elisa, and we were looking at each other, say, but what are they, don't they have a secretary that at least can open Wikipedia, you know, and, and draft something reasonable for them? So I said, if uh, we, we, we don't understand each other when we speak about something we care for, um, words are the bricks with which we build our thoughts. And we really have to understand what, what we mean by these words. Because, of course, we say, ah, for um, ex to evaluate excellence in crafts, of course, the territory is very important. Okay, you open the dictionary, there is a definition of territory. But if you are an artisan, what does that mean to you? So we thought, well, it, we, we think it is important to really understand, first of all, which these words are. And then we started to investigate the most objective reference that we could find, law and legislation. And we took different examples, so Italy, Germany, France, the UK, and Japan. And we tried to, to, to distill the words that always recurred, up to arriving to these 11 criteria. And then we had to define them in the words of the craft and test them also on some very special <laughs> like candidates, like finest, like a, a selection of recognized, acknowledged European maestros. Why this? I think there are two perspectives when we talk about um, evaluating excellence. One perspective is like saying, yes, no, yes, no. You, maybe you, never you. Like, I never believed in this. Um, I think that a real change can happen from um, share, from a communion of thoughts, from something that we can share and where we all believe. So our metric, these 11 criteria with their really uh, definitions, it was not made to say you're good, you're not, but they were made to say look at what we consider excellent craftsmanship. Look at these acknowledged masters all over Europe that perfectly embody all of these criteria. You can get there. You are young or you're whatever, but you can achieve that level. And maybe you need a little help to understand where you could do better. Because maybe you are great in originality and creativity, but you lack a little something in uh, your relationship with the territory or something else. So this metric is there as an instrument also to, to help understanding where, where we should go. And actually, in this panel, I mean, the, the, the four of you, you do represent, in a way, the, the decision makers, like museums and international institutions. An academy, I mean, a school is all about evaluating the talent and the supreme French Institute for, for acknowledging who is a maestro and, and who's not. And we all got um, inspired by what you do constantly. Why do we think it is important to be here together? Because Europe has something to offer on, on the world skate, on, on what can we really be competitive, on mass production, well, maybe, but according to our two founders, Johan Rupert and Franco Cologni, here we, we do still know how to create something that will make people's hearts beat faster. As we always say, do we need another jacket? Do we need another watch? Do we need another table? We don't need anything, but we need to dream. And only master craftsmen can add that little touch of something that will make an object no more neutral, but special. To imagine how to help people becoming masters, I think is to help our society uh, acknowledge talent, creativity for what they are, not like in the TV shows where everybody's got talent. It's not true. 
challenge has to be acknowledged, evaluated, and helped. And the name Maestro, Master, is the sweetest and the most important name that a human being can give to another human being after the name of father or mother. So this is why we do believe it is important to share a common ground. And to, so, so the book is just a starting point, but Homo Faber is, in a way, um, our model transformed into reality, and your presence here today is the next step to see what can we achieve together. Thank you for this uh, emotional statement, uh, Alberto, but I think emotion, this is something that we all need in uh, this field. And um, we all, I think we all have uh, experienced it, that you're walking up to uh, a piece of, uh, a masterpiece of a craftsman, you say, wow, it's, this is a masterwork. Yeah. And um, a question that um, uh, poses itself to me uh, upon this is, um, um, do you achieve this um, uh, in a direct process uh, of education in the workshop, uh, like uh, uh, with uh, Gerard Descon or in the, in the uh, school in uh, Latvia, or are there also these uh, um, genial talents, I would uh, call them, who take uh, very strange uh, uh, um, uh, roads to, to achieve this? I think this is something uh, we will also have uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, discuss uh, how to get uh, to, common, uh, uh, to a common notion of what uh, craft education would be. Luis, um, from your perspective uh, uh, with the World Craft Council, uh, is this a topic that uh, you are discussing in your meetings? Um, of course it is, um, and it's hugely topical at the moment. I think everybody in this room is aware um, that a huge number of universities across Europe uh, have been closing um, many of their craft courses, and that's, uh, it's, a, it's an economic decision. Um, it's, it's not really a, a long-term a long view. Um, and certainly I know I was looking at the work of Francis Priest in the exhibition in Best of Europe, and, and, and then I think talking to Fiona, who was saying that there's no, you can no longer study ceramics in Scotland, which is an absolute crying shame. Uh, we have a similar situation in Ireland. Uh, many of you will remember Waterford Crystal as a brand, and uh, that was a huge loss when, when, when that factory closed down. And it was a loss, uh, obviously, not only of jobs, but of potential skills, because there are master craftspeople, master engravers, master cutters, uh, who got so disenfranchised that they never wanted to look at a piece of glass or share their skills again, and that was in the way that that was managed and handled. Um, and I think it's, it's hugely important that we recognize the need to preserve those skills because they will disappear, and many of them have disappeared already. It's almost, um, you know, we live on a planet that's made up of natural resources. We're, we're not only losing um, uh, animals and insects and the biodiversity of this, but we're also losing those skills. And we have to recognize that that is part of our biodiversity. That's part of our, our culture, our identity, our language, and the way that we communicate. And I think it's uh, hugely important that we get Europe, as in, in terms of the European Commission and the people who are decision makers, to actually recognize that and to start investing in that. I think um, what's happening here as part of the Michelangelo Foundation is it's elevating awareness. But unless that carries through, well then, uh, you know, we're really just talking to ourselves. Um, in Ireland, we have, we, we, we have two um, very specialized skills training courses. Um, they only take in 12 students a year, one in, in goldsmithing and jewelry and one in ceramics. Um, and they take, sorry, they take those 12 students in every two years. And it's, it's focused on, on high-end skills, on that level of training um, that you can't get anymore in, in many of the third level colleges. Yeah. And I think that's probably the direction that we need to look at a little bit more and, and certainly even in catering to, to uh, some of the talents that are required to keep the luxury industry going. We absolutely need to be working at that uh, high level. Um, I suppose some of the encouraging stories from uh, across Europe, I remember going to a meeting in Kosice in Slovakia uh, where Ulov is based and I know there's uh, some people from Ulov here today and I was, I was absolutely amazed because there's huge investment in Slo Slovakia in the preservation of traditional craft. Um, some of the challenges they have is actually that, that, that they're not making that transition uh, into 
into more contemporary craft. Um, so in, 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 some, in some respects, they're a little bit stuck in that tradition, or at least the mindset of government and what they will fund is, is, is stuck in that. But there's huge opportunity, and it's, I suppose, very encouraging to see that that is being preserved. And I think in the countries where um, craft has survived and is surviving, uh, I suppose, as they become richer within themselves, we have to be careful that it's not pushed out even further. Um, and certainly in an international context, if you look at, um, there's a, a World Crafts Council program for craft cities across Europe and across the world. Uh, and you look at some of those regions and understand it's the bedrock often of, of their economies and of their culture. Um, and, and it's really important that we recognize, uh, I suppose, how much it contributes. Um, you know, we're in, a fir we're in first world countries, uh, in third world countries, actually craft is often, you know, the, the foundation of, of, of a lot of their income, of a lot of their societies and communities. Uh, Yeva, um, how would you see this from your experience? Uh, because it, um, I'm sharing your experience um, that, uh, for example, in Austria, there's you, you, don't, you can't train as a as a uh, craft potter anymore in in Austria. The, the, uh, it's, uh, I think uh, uh, with uh, education in uh, countries as yours, how do you um, experience the interest uh, of uh, young students uh, for the craft? So I agree with everything what my colleague Louis said, and uh, and yes, probably you still can study uh, craft pottery in in our country, but you can just get acquainted, and then you should continue already. You should make an uh, I don't know some design or art of it, but you can't you know receive a higher education diploma just uh, making pottery, any pottery. That's it. So. So it's just to continue the same thoughts. It's that uh, with a kind of better life, yes, with the westernized, uh, with the West coming to the East. I mean, so we are losing crafts as well. So it's the the better people live, the the crafts are less preserved. That's for sure. I mean, I agree with it. So we experienced that in in last one to five years after the. Uh, Soviet era collapsed. So, yes. So, I if uh, I compare the um, uh, higher uh, art education uh, in, in, in Western countries and uh, what, what is in Belarus or Russia, so, yes, Eastern European countries, uh, our higher education in, in design and fine arts are in the middle already between Far West and and um, and Eastern, and and we're losing with every day what we used to know very well. Mm. And Gerard, how do you see the situation as you having uh, taught uh, a lot uh, in the Institut des Arts et Métiers? Um, uh, what what is your experience of the French situation of today in uh, this field? Um, uh, talking about uh, losing experience in the uh, craft uh, field in France. I mean, France is a traditionally a country that is very um, strongly feeling about uh, the craft, isn't it? Oh, c'est sur la position. Yes, uh, in France, we have a, a great um, chance uh, to uh, to get uh, an institute and national of arts and craft and uh, um, many ministries uh, which uh, support uh, the art and craft in France um, when we organize uh, the international uh, uh, journey of art and craft, uh, we can show that uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe uh, it's not the same thing. And uh, many uh, countries are, are not, uh, don't have the, the chance uh, in France. And uh, we, we have also uh, many schools of high quality 
Um, so Colbull, um, Stien, Dupere, uh, and Sama. Uh, and they, um, um, they can um, to proceed an um, important evolution of, of the, the state of mind and uh, the, the creative uh, uh, and, uh, and also uh, heritage economy. Uh, because it, it's very difficult to, uh, it's not easy to, to place art and craft in, in the society. Uh, somewhere between, uh, uh, in between uh, uh, arts and uh, economy, uh, and concept and, and, and technical. Uh, so it, it's not easy to uh, to find uh, to to find solution for uh, for the the, the, the new uh, generation and the um, yes uh, the, the, <laughs> the title of master of art yes it, it's um, it's important because uh, uh, it's a, a good sign for um, uh, from the, the how our ministry, uh, I, 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 um, I talk about the, the Japanese, and the, the, uh, they decided to, to create a, a national living treasure. And when the culture, uh, the Ministry of Culture in France decided also, uh, it's uh, for us and. Uh, Reconnaissance and recognize uh, our place in, in, in the, the society and in the, the top of, of the creative and, and, and also heritage economy. Um, and um, this, um, this title permet, uh, permettre. allows. Uh, allows. allows uh, uh, to communicate uh, the, with the, all the medias and uh, also to, to, to convey, to, to, um, to pass the, the know-how, uh, the knowledge and the gesture uh, to the new generation. Uh, it was a, a good decision, uh, but to know uh, uh, it's important to um, to ameliorate, to, um, <laughs> to ameliorate uh, the system for the for, for the new generation of master and the, yes. I think um, you, you just uh, cited the um, example of Japan with the national treasures, the uh, craftsmen that have a high social esteem uh, in Japan in a country that is. Uh, much more known for the uh, high technology uh, than for its craftsmanship uh, in the in the common uh, um, uh, knowledge. But um, uh, I think this is a good example. And I, I would like to ask uh, Alberto, um, when uh, doing your um, study on the um, uh, hand of the master and uh, um, preparing the uh, uh, Homo Faber exhibition, um, did you come uh, to um, decisive uh, um, things that you would say um, this is a core of what we have to define as uh, being uh, important for, uh, I would say, maybe an European definition what uh, craft is uh, nowadays? Yes, we, at the Michelangelo Foundation, we, we deeply um, consider this. And uh, part of the reason why we organize Homo Faber is also to show the real thing. So uh, I do believe that the title, I mean, Gerard is a super skillful artisan, but at a certain moment, the official title of Maitre d'Art, anyway, as, as you were saying, changes the way the society perceives you. You are always the same, but this title in a way polarizes, so you are a maestro. You already were a maestro, but then I think this acknowledgement 
is important. I mean, when Prince Albert, the, the husband of Queen Victoria, opened in, I think, 1852, the, the South Kensington Museum, which is now the Victorian Albert Museum, and he displayed his incredible collection of ceramics, of glass, of, why did he do that? Because he was generous? Well, yes and no. He did that because he already understood that the British production was kind of losing something. And he wanted the British craftsmen and proto-designers, if so I can say, to see the real thing, to see the beautiful vases, the beautiful glasses, the beautiful decoration, and say, hey, look at that. You have the chance of seeing that. Get inspired. You don't have to copy. You don't have to go away from that. You have to be inspired. So homophobic is all about proposing the, the, the level of excellence that we have in mind, with all its different waves, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we were saying, like uh, an international institution like the, the World Craft Council, of, co of course you have to be plural, but the, in, in, in this multiplicity of points of view anyway, we have to know what we are proposing. Sometimes there are no's, like no thanks, that we have to say that cost us a lot but they nevertheless are necessary. It's like educating a child. And, and I think that sometimes, and we see it like in TV shows, there is this kind of, of this childish behavior. So if I don't tell you that you're fabulous, you start crying. Mm. Hey, please, we're talking about excellence and we're talking about educating a generation to acknowledge the value of excellence. Yeah. You don't become a master in one day. And even Leonardo da Vinci had to go to study with Verrocchio. And we're talking about Leonardo da Vinci. So, uh, if uh, a, a system of evaluating excellence can be integrated, like in didactic programs, like in Lithuania or, or any way, we, we can try to see how to integrate it also in, in, in the programs of relevant international institutions without saying, this is the Bible, this is the gospel, amen, but saying, we are trying to indicate a certain way so that when we say maestro, we know what we're talking about. And we know that this becomes something that the young generations can look at. Maybe like every young person does, uh, they can reject it, say, oh, please again. But then something leaves. And it, it, to, to conclude, uh, the two, in my opinion, most important criteria that you can find the master's touch are the ones starting with an I, interpretation and innovation. Interpretation means that a master craftsman is not just an executor, is not an insect that keeps on doing the same things, the same gesture. No, it's someone who can understand what's in the head of the creative, of the designer or whatever, and can transform it into something more beautiful. Um, interpretation gives sense and meaning to what the master craftsmen do. And innovation, I mean, as I said in the beginning of Homo Faber, the real enemy, as I was saying yesterday, is not technology, it's ignorance. So innovation, all the great master craftsmen have been innovative, but real innovation is generative. What does it mean? That from a new idea, something beautiful starts, and in, and in what you do, what you did, your pupil, your student, will take up something else. This is a real innovation, it's not novelty like your new phone and, and, and the old one you throw away. This is novelty, this is not innovation. And to educate, to acknowledging the importance of this, I think it's something we all believe in. Very good, yes. And just, just to reinforce that point, point Alberto, um, if anyone's ever gone to China, uh, I was lucky enough to go a few years ago, um, and they have incredibly skilled uh, craftspeople, um, but all they can do is replicate. Uh, they can just copy. So that level of innovation, interpretation and design is so hugely important in terms of the future and the evolution of craftsmanship going forward. So I think you're right. Yes, I, I would like to uh, enforce this, what Luis uh, said. Um, I think this is the European quality of craft, the innovation in the craft. It's, uh, it's not repetitive and, and it is uh, in the end also personal and uh, I think this is something that we uh, uh, must very much uh, uh, propose. And uh, what Alberto was citing, of course, with uh, Prince Albert and the founding of uh, uh, doing, staging the first great exhibition and uh, in the end uh, 
uh, opening the South Kensington Museum. I think this is also an important issue, and it's something that uh, also Homo Faber has started again with this exhibition that you are um, um, proposing uh, high-end uh, examples for the and uh, for for the for all fields of the craft. And this is, uh, I think, something that makes, uh, especially modern techniques, make a lot easier nowadays to. Uh, make it uh, ac accessible to to uh, pupils who want to go into the field, and I think this is something uh, we should maybe also discuss now. Um, how do we um, use uh, the the new media that are all are all over also in uh, Homo Fava, if it's uh, 3D uh, uh, or the videos, etc. Um, how do we use new media um, to really um, um, uh, collect this information and and keep this information because I think this is the uh, special uh, 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 thing that we are facing now that uh, in times of uh, uh, knowledge uh, in in other fields going down um, how would you uh, see this uh, in your field uh, Louis is this something that uh, worldcraft uh, is also dealing uh, with yeah, well, I suppose there's a lot of different um, sides to that question. Um, in one respect, where we are in society at the moment, where we have an unparalleled opportunity to document um, and to preserve and to archive uh, in a very tangible and real way uh, those craft skills. But of course, the human touch, you can never get away from the human touch. You always need to keep that in mind. Um, and of course, there's a lot of new technologies and a lot of discussion about the impact of those technologies on the craft sector. And um, I mean, again, I think you said it last night, Alberto, it really, it's a tool. It's, it, it's not going to um, uh, take over. It never should take over because it's actually the combination and the fusion uh, of that human intelligence, of, of the knowledge of materials, uh, and I suppose the investment and embedding of an emotion uh, in an object that is, that, that's when it starts to become mastery because that's when it impacts you and that's when it starts to convey uh, a very strong message to you. And uh, I, I did get a chance to have a go of one of the virtual reality sets. Um, uh, and I think it's very interesting and I think that that's probably what is coming down the line in terms of technology. Um, if it's managed right, will again really serve to elevate craft. I think when the Industrial Revolution happened and mass production came in, craft became very disenfranchised, as we all know. Um, but on another level, what it has done is it's made us more discerning. Um, it's, 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 I suppose, in a way, democratized that access to very uh, beautifully designed objects or, or goods. And now, I suppose, we're at a moment in time, because of that discernment, where we're actually demanding to have something that's very, very beautifully crafted, very, very beautifully made. So there's always a counterpoint to, to, to things that, that have happened. Um, and even in terms of uh, augmented reality, I think that actually potentially has a huge imp impact on craft. I've been talking to, there's a couple of companies that have set up an art Ireland using augmented reality and they're essentially taking away that interface that need to divide your attention from reading instructions into actually having them directly in front of you and being able to man manipulate in real time and I think that has a lot of interesting potential and possibilities for for the ongoing development of the sector yes it goes very much into the direction of uh, um, craft is uh, being something uh, permanently innovative because I think we have to go back to this uh, tradition that you find in the craft field that uh, all master craftsmen uh, in their time have been very open to contemporary techniques and uh, if it was uh, appropriate for their uh, goal, for their vision, of course they included the contemporary uh, techniques uh, in order to achieve what they had uh, in their vision and, and, and in their mind. Yeva, um, how do you uh, experience this uh, um, uh, challenge of uh, uh, documenting uh, techniques uh, in Latvia in, in your uh, um, field. Uh, this is something uh, that is uh, something being we done. should start doing, but we are not. I mean, it's. Uh, but now I'm thinking that we should start documenting, and I also want just to add uh, to the to innovation into craftsmanship, maybe uh, also creativity. Mm? This is maybe another approach what is important and uh, maybe I just thought um, um, maybe this is, was not the question but 
just an idea to say that uh, uh, what nowadays young generation attracts uh, into getting to know some skills in one or another craft is probably in, a, in this context of, of losing traditions is just to, 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 to be the one who knows already, who distinguish among uh, their peers uh, as somebody who knows already much more than the others. So many of the young generation are already into uh, glass art, stained glass, uh, jewelry, just because then they differ from the others who, are, who can talk, but who cannot do anything. Mm. So it's also this specialization in uh, fields that uh, you feel are, um, uh, in, a, in a way, indigenous to, to your country in the, in the craft field that, that you see in, in, in yeah and it's you know our country is very small worth three million but uh, it's just Rome yeah or, yeah but uh, but maybe many countries near us part of Europe I think it's uh, this interest in 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 those hands-on study programs in all academies, Netherlands wherever you go is you, you can feel that it's going down and up and from this down, which was, you know, it was not only that we had four stained glass students in our academy, but it was in Gary Treatfield Academy that they had also two students five years ago. But from those downs, there are also up hills. So mm -hmm. I just positive that with the help of these kind of initiatives, we'll go up quicker. Hmm? Sure. Um, something about excellence. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, many people want to reach excellence, and um, um, everybody uh, agrees to evaluate um, the quality of uh, know-how, of expertise, uh, knowledge, uh, gesture. It, it's relatively easy, but uh, what about excellence? Uh, for me, I think that excellence is close to trust, and uh, the trust of uh, uh, Venezia uh, is different from trust of uh, Vilnius. Sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> and the importance of uh, local culture. Um, determines uh, the view and determines the opinion uh, we have on the object. I think. I think this is this is really um, something that uh, we are all facing. That um, if if we want to um, get to a common maybe European vision, it's very very important that we um, first uh, define our regional uh, vision of it. As Alberto has done it. Uh, and um, on this basis, maybe uh, it's, uh, we can get into something that, that you do it in, in databases too, that you are uh, exchanging your knowledge and the, that you are defining on this uh, big uh, core of data um, some uh, fields that are common. And I think this uh, would be a challenge for us for the, for the future um, if we are able to uh, get to a common vision of uh, what uh, master craftsmanship is and what what uh, an evaluation of craftsmanship would be that would also lead to this uh, um, very much needed uh, social uh, uh, upheaval of uh, the common notion of the master craftsman again. And I know if you yeah. it, it's something we, we truly believe in and, and, and you were correctly pointing out, it's a social upheaval. Um, evaluating excellence also means to offer to the young generations model where they can recognize that they can desire to become like that. And uh, it, it's not impossible. I mean, in, in, in France, Gérard has been at the head of the institute that does this. 
Uh, I mean, uh, Yeva, you, you are in, in, in a structure that daily has to evaluate talent excellence, though in a nutshell, so you have to see in the future what's it going to be. And I mean, Louise, you constantly have to, have to face the, the challenge of, of a world in such a huge uh, uh, evolution that sometimes the notion, the notion of excellence might run the risk of being too much diluted. But once again, if I may permit, the Michelangelo Foundation is not here to take anybody's place. We are here to work with you. And we do believe in the importance of acknowledging skilled artisans as masters. We do believe that young generations need examples to look at and to say, I can transform my talent into a profession. And, and this is why we are trying to discuss about it. And, and this is why we think that if we want to craft together a more human future, it is good, it is correct to, to indicate a certain path. Uh, time are changing and we, we cannot think that even these uh, evaluating instruments are, are out of time. But at the same time, authenticity is something that will always have to drive uh, our, our decisions. As, many other factors that we are acknowledging. Are we perfect? We're not. Nobody is. But I think that together we can find points of view that can help all of us acknowledging throughout Europe, throughout our countries, throughout our territories, throughout all the different histories that we live and that we want to transmit into the future, those examples, those points, those levels that really make our heart feel better as it always happens when you face authentic beauty. And this is what I try to teach to my students. I mean, to teach Italian beauty, me, please. But at least I, I try to open their eyes to how they can integrate the DNA of beauty in, in, in what they do and, and in their design. Thank you, Roberto. I think it was very important uh, what you mentioned, this moralic uh, um, uh, aspect that, uh, of course, uh, is... Uh, uh, vital to uh, uh, the field that we are discussing today and uh, an evaluation must also uh, of uh, contemporary craftsmanship must also face this uh, aspect which is uh, a social aspect uh, in the end. Uh, we are all um, uh, very much uh, um, coined by this uh, um, high appreciation of the white collar job in uh, 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 comparison to what uh, uh, the uh, edu craft education was uh, seen, but this is uh, uh, what we are experiencing now. This is really changing very fast, and I think this is the important situation that we are facing, and all our institutions uh, uh, should uh, deal with this. Yes, Louis. Could I, I just come in because uh, I suppose it strikes me that um, there's the support in terms of skills, there's the striving for excellence, um, but actually in order for all of that to work, the supporting infrastructure that supports livelihoods within the craft sector is hugely important. Um, and we're very challenged in being able to provide for that uh, across Europe. And I think, in, I mean, to give you an example, in Ireland we have uh, an arts council that support, supports arts, uh, and there are a lot of incentives so there's a program called Estona, which would be like, uh, you know, a mastery, a living uh, natural talent. Um, there's also uh, benefits that you can get tax relief on if you produce original pieces of work, but it doesn't apply to crafts. And you sit here and you wonder, why doesn't it apply to crafts? And I, I, I remember reading um, Glenn Adamson, who, who's curated many exhibitions in, in the V&A, and he, he talks about the fact that craft always took a back seat. It's the backbone, actually, of, um, of that process of making and that process of creation. But the reality is, is that very often what we perceive or what we label as art or what we perceive and label as design are the ones that get the accolades and the recognition. And I think fundamentally we need to change that. We need to change the mindset of it. We need to change it at political level. And I know uh, they're, they're um, doing the multi-annual framework uh, for funding in Europe at the moment. Uh, and they're talking about the uh, art as agency and art as cultural diplomacy and art in terms of the impact um, from, from a so social and societal point of view. And actually, craft has to be on, the, on that agenda. I mean, we, we can't sit back and, and not fight for that with everything that we have uh, if we want this to truly be embedded, to truly become part of, uh, of the fabric of our lives and to truly become something that's you know, a very human attribute. So I 
think that's something that's just important to recognize. We joined the army. <laughs> no. um, uh, to sum up a little bit, I think um, uh, what uh, we have uh, discussed in this uh, hour now, um, uh, this is what uh, the challenge uh, that, that uh, is posed to all our institutions uh, that we are working on, and it uh, can't be only uh, carried by uh, the Michelangelo Foundation. It has to be, I think, uh, at least a European project to um, evaluate uh, uh, craft uh, to uh, get back to a higher um, uh, social esteem for the master uh, of crafts and to document and to carry on this uh, intangible uh, cultural heritage that has uh, uh, as, as such been defined by uh, uh, the uh, UNESCO already uh, with this uh, common uh, definition of craft as being uh, intangible, intangible uh, cultural heritage. Uh, well, there, I, yes. just wa I just wanted to uh, open the, the um, question, uh, see if there were any questions in the audience. We do have a few minutes left and it might be nice to have questions in the audience. I know that there's one right here. Well, I'll take you a second. Tadis Kockel of uh, ZDH in Germany. Um, you indicated the, the book, which is uh, very good, uh, um, a study on uh, the intangible aspect of crafts in Austria. And as far as I remember, it places the role of the entrepreneur in the middle so you can't uh, disconnect the craftsperson from the role as an entre entrepreneur, normally a vocationally ed educated entrepreneur. Now, in your evaluation of, uh, of, the, of the what is craft, uh, you haven't exactly reflected on this economic uh, or cultural role as an entrepreneur. Uh, do you think that is important? Uh, yes, I think it's very important. Um, this is, um, as, as you said, this is an important uh, topic also in this uh, study on uh, um, this, the Austrian situation of the crafts. And I think this is a field where we, uh, as institutions and uh, also as governments, maybe can uh, uh, give a lot of support to the contemporary craftsmen because uh, uh, every craftsman uh, uh, active in the field knows about the challenges that become more and more threatening uh, f uh, from the markets, from uh, tax regulation, uh, all the uh, um, legal uh, regulations that, that are forced on the um, productive uh, craftsmen. So this is a very uh, important aspect, uh, I would say, which could also be uh, um, a topic for um, uh, European Union uh, regulations to to make it easier for the real uh, gifted uh, master uh, if he is acknowledged as uh, in a way that as Alberto has uh, defined it uh, to to work in his field and to make it easier for him to work in the field. If this ask, answers your question. Thank you. So. My name is Nadine Fischer, and I'm uh, the owner of Tresor in Basel, the actual economic fair in this section. Uh, Louise, you have mentioned something which with we had great, great problem, and I feel that it would be a wonderful thing for also the Michelangelo Foundation and everyone in this room to help us, and that is with the word in craft. Uh, if we say artisans or artisans in France, everyone closes the door and says, ah, no, 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 we rien à faire avec ça, we're not coming to your fair, this is des artisans, c'est pas nous. It's a, it's a huge problem. If we use the same word in England, it has a little different meaning. And we insisted in calling our, our fair Trésor Contemporary Craft because we believe in the word craft. And I feel we have to get that word out of being sort of slightly tarnished in a strange way, 
or we have to invent a new word for the excellency of objects. So I do hope this is going to be a topic in the future because it's uh, very close to my heart. Yeah, I, I just I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, but it's actually the onus is on us to claim that word and and to claim the excellence and the beauty that is inherent within craft. Um, I'm laughing, I'm smiling because I can see ads of BMW and all sorts of um, other type of talking about the craft. Um, so it is, I think there's a zeitgeist moment. I think we are in a moment of um, potential for the renaissance that we've, we've spoken about. Um, but actually, we have to stand up and own it, and we have to also stand up and define what we mean by it. And I think that's probably what has been so wonderful about um, you know, the, the book, this event, everything that's happening, and, and that confluence. Um, and I think it's a great moment. I think, I think it's the moment that we do that, and we do it with pride and honor and a little bit of fierceness. Good morning, Ana Chuta Valveascoa, chairwoman of the Loewe uh, Craft Prize, of the jury, sorry. <laughs> she, she is the chairwoman of the <laughs> Loewe Foundation, yes. Uh, well, this very last topic is very interesting for us because we didn't know how to handle it, how to express what we were looking for. And actually, uh, Luis just pointed out, I mean, historically, there has been a distinction between the arts and art. And there were different things. And as Luis said before, uh, if you go to China, you find a lot of skillful uh, artisans who cannot make art. So how do we call someone who is an artisan and a craft maker who makes art? And we don't know if we're right or not, but at the Loewe Foundation, we decided we were going to call it craft with artistic ambition. So if it helps, it's there. Yes, I think um, initiatives like the Loewe Prize uh, are very important in this field in your um, second uh, edition. I think you're, you're going into the third uh, round now. So I think this has helped a lot uh, also for the reappreciation of uh, what, what we would def define as craft nowadays. Here. Hello, my name is Mirella. Hi, Alberto, because this question is for you. I'm representing a Romanian private foundation for tangible and intangible heritage. Uh, I've been appreciating this exhibition. I think the concept is very deep and it proposes a lot of issues to go on. My question is kind of theoretical because um, it, what I have seen in the exhibition, it's part also of my practical experience with the foundation and with my classes that I teach at the National University of Arts in Romania, and I teach design also, so I have a public and a private practice. The idea is that the exhibition stresses out also the connection, the overlapping, and the hazy borderline between craft and design. And I know they are having a very weird and bizarre historical story of love and, you know, hate and starting from the arts and crafts and William Morris and the machine and socialist ideology. But now, after modernism and after Bauhaus education, arts and crafts together, and the Industrial Revolution and after postmodernism, which I have been seeing it in this exhibition also, I mean, Gaetano Pesci being restored by, an art, by a craft people, right? My question is, especially in your view, Alberto, what is the relationship between art, craft, and design? Because craft and design are under the umbrella of arts with a big A, and in the same time, craft and design are working and not working together according to the perception of art or design terminology in terms of history, political, economic systems, and so on. So design is returning to crafts. That's, you know, the trend during the last years. Also, craft is something based on excellency, as you have been telling us and showing us. 
So what, in your opinion, is this relationship going? So it's an open question with an open answer. I'm really aware of it, but I would like really to Thank to you, Mirela. No, but it's, uh, of, of course, it's, uh, it's a super good question. It's like the question that basically we, we all posed to ourselves. At the same time, you know, I mean, why we are in Venice? Because in, in the 19th century, John Ruskin, just looking at the Palazzo Ducale over there and watching the capitals that had been sculpted by the master sculptor, uh, of the Middle Ages, he said, this is what human hands are capable of doing. And the capital of the planets of the astrological representation in Ruskin's mind was the most beautiful thing he ever saw. I mean, those sculptors, they were what? They were artisans, they were artists, they were proto-designers. Okay, sometimes I have to say that the um, temptation of putting labels and definitions on everything is a little dangerous. At the same time, we have to recognize and acknowledge that diversity is a value. I mean, at Tomo Faber, you find 18 different exhibitions and uh, great numbers of curators that we have called to help us developing original points of view. Because otherwise, if we had made the Encyclopedia of Craft, I mean, how boring, it's not, of no interest for everybody. So, to answer your question, we do believe in the value of dialogue. Plato, the Greek philosopher, I mean, all of his works were dialogues. From the dialogue, something new, something interesting can start. So in the room, Best of Europe, Jean Blanchard selected pieces created from A to Z by one person, one artisan. That was his talent or her talent. That was her passion, their skills. And we find it represented there. In the refectory, Michele De Lucchi invited designers and artisans to work together. Are the pieces in Blanchard's room more beautiful or less beautiful than the pieces in De Lucchi's room? That is not the question. They are both beautiful. And in Isabella Villafranca's laboratory, we see fabulous artworks being restored and being given new life by something else. So, for us, what is important is to acknowledge and to recognize the value of uh, dexterity, of craftsmanship, and again, to try to take away what Michael Herzfeld, the anthropologist of Harvard, calls gentle racism. Gentle racism, like, oh, so you're an artisan. Mm. Mm. Say, like, pretending you're interested, but you're not. Uh, and, and this is really a state of mind that we have to fight through culture. So, I mean, design, arts, crafts, they, they, they meet each other, they separate each other. What we have to find is the perfect dialogue and the perfect symphony, trying to avoid that we speak all our life in prose without even knowing, like the bourgeois gentilhomme, you know, in, in Molière. Yes, uh, I think Alberto is uh, perfectly right, and if I uh, uh, may uh, add to it, I think this is also probably brings us back to the social aspect, because nowadays the designer is seen as somebody who's uh, genius, uh, uh, but uh, what we are facing, uh, especially nowadays, uh, is that most of the designers, they, uh, they even admit that they would be nothing without the uh, um, art artisanal and uh, master craft uh, skills that they can make use of and uh, in a way uh, also institutions like the one I'm uh, working at uh, were in charge of this uh, strange uh, uh, separation that happened in the second half of the 19th century when uh, the growing industry had the need of uh, uh, designing uh, people who were really uh, meant to be designers for the, for the industry, uh, separating this uh, path uh, from the uh, artisanal and uh, craft paths. And uh, I think this is uh, hopefully uh, what we are facing nowadays, that uh, this leads into uh, something new, much more powerful, as uh, we can see in Homo Faba. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. Thank you to our panelists for this wonderful panel uh, a discussion. If I can sum up in just a few words, I think uh, we can, uh, what we have seen very clearly is that we do have a need for a common language. That's quite important. We also have some challenges to common language in terms of developing a common language in terms not only of the uh, 
the regional and, and very specific and very beautiful diversity that we all have and represent, but also in terms of language that works not for us, but against us, language that divides us. I think it's also absolutely wonderful that we come up with our own language. In the case of Jean Blanchard's room, we call them artist artisans. Uh, in the Michelangelo Foundation's vocabulary, at the very beginning, I spent an awful lot of time myself thinking about words, and we happen to use always master artisans. Uh, to distinguish, uh, in, in order to distinguish the fact uh, that these are artisans of a certain level and artisans capable, if they want, of uh, creative, uh, in, uh, interpretive work. But they don't have to be. To be a master artisan who's not interested in creative work is, is also something just fine. So I think the, uh, maybe one of the, the, the things that we can continue to work together on is developing language that works for us. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we would love for you to use the master's touch criteria in your own countries, in your own ways, and then give us feedback. Are those terms helpful? Do they help us? Do they help us put forward our own goals, our collective goals, and our individual goals? So we would love to do that. The, the Michelangelo Foundation is also very interested in working uh, through you and with you to develop evaluation schemes, if they're useful to you, if they're applicable to your needs, and uh, to promoting uh, what we're all here to promote. With that, I would like to, uh, the, the other thing that was evoked in this conversation, which leads us very nicely into the next conversation is the threat to educational systems now, the threat to crafts programs and hands-on programs, and therefore uh, what we feel is a great need for innovative means of transmission of craftsmanship. So with that, I would like to call the next panel uh, into session.